The principal textbook for this course, 20th Century Economic History, is the current, or rather I suppose a very recent draft, of my own book forthcoming from basic books, Slouching Towards Utopia, an Economic History of the Long 20th Century, 1870 to, to when? Well, maybe it's 2004, maybe it's 2008, maybe it's 2012, maybe it's 2016. It depends on where we think the big story of the 20th century comes to an end. But there is one thing um, that I am very clear about. The book starts um, in 1870. It is in 1870 that this big story of the 20th century actually begins. You see, what I call the long 20th century started with the watershed boundary crossing that took place around 1870. Um, you cross into a new watershed, you cross a divide, when all of a sudden the rivers start flowing in a different direction from the rivers that, the direction the rivers had flowed before. Behind me, behind me right now, is a picture of Lemhi Pass, where Meriwether Lewis and Clark crossed the Continental Divide for the first time during their expedition into what was then called the Louisiana Territory early in the 1800s. And they knew that something big had changed. Indeed, something big did change around the year 1870. Um, perhaps the biggest change in human history since the discovery of fire or the invention of language. Um, around 1870, you see, the triple emergence of globalization the Industrial Research Lab and the Modern Corporation began to pull the world out of the dire poverty that had been humanity's lot, certainly for the previous 10,000 years since the discovery of agriculture, and highly likely for all time that we have been you know, on the earth. You see, before 1870, we had a slow growth close to Malthusian world. Yes, people advanced in the technologies that they were able to use to manipulate nature and to organize themselves, but these advancements were slow. And every improvement in human living standards, well, it caused a disturbance in the ecological balance between our population and our resources. So better technology meant population grew and population grew until resource scarcity meant that even with the better technology, um, population was back to very close to stable, which means that humanity was very poor. Even in the 1770 to 1870 Industrial Revolution century, when technology began to gain a few steps on fecundity, it only managed to gain a very few steps on fecundity. And after 2004, 2008, 2012, maybe 2016, you had stalled recovery from the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, that the North Atlantic economies could no longer claim to have the secret of rapid economic growth that other countries needed to learn from, um, and the secret of maintaining full employment. They seem to have lost that. You had system destabilizing waves of political and cultural anger. And the political and political economic systems of the global north that had led the world since before 1870 into increasing prosperity seemed completely inept at dealing with new challenges. Global warming chief among them. After some fuzzy time between 2004 and 2016, it was clear that the story of increasing prosperity led by the global north that had been the 20th century had come to an end and that a new story had been about to become. In between, um, in between we have the story of the long 20th century from 1870 to whenever, call it 2012 right now. Um, in between, things were marvelous and terror-inducing. More marvelous, I claim, than in any previous century, but also at least as terror-inducing as in any previous century. It was, I strongly believe, the most consequential 
single century that humanity has had. And it was the first century in which the most important historical thread was beyond doubt what everyone would call the economic. Um, what makes it the most consequential century? Well, after 1870, we got institutions and technologies. Full globalization, the industrial research laboratory, the modern corporation. These were the keys that unlocked the gate that had previously kept humanity in dire, dire poverty. Thus, the prospect problem of making humanity rich could now be posed to the market economy because it had a solution. And on the other side of the gate that had been unlocked, the trail to true utopia came into view, and everything else good should have followed, um, should have followed from that. Now, this thing I have just said, it is a grand narrative. Um, and to make that the grand narrative requires that we look at the story as one that starts in 1870, with the industrial coming of the industrial research lab, the modern corporation, and full globalization. You know, others want to call different grand narratives, right? That my idea of the long 20th century stands in contrast to what others, you know, most notably the Marxist British historian Eric Hobsbawm, here looking over my left shoulder, have called the short 20th century that they trace from the start of World War I in 1914 to the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. Um, still others see the 19th century as the long rise of democracy and capitalism from 1776 to 1914, and the short 20th century as one in which totalitarianism in its socialist and fascist dimensions shake the world. The person looking over my right shoulder, um, Friedrich von Hayek, sees the story, a grand narrative, as one of the market economy tends to get, tries hard to get people as close to utopia as possible, but is undermined by the two forces of um, socialism and permissiveness. All of these grand narratives require that you begin and end your story at the right time. You know, Hausbaum writes his book, The Age of Extremes, about 1914 to 1991, and that makes it very easy for Hobsbawm to tell the story he wants to tell. But I really think it does so at the price of his missing much of what I strongly believe is the bigger, more important story. The story that runs from 1870 to 2016 or so, from humanity's 1870 unlocking the gate that had kept it in dire material poverty, until our 20. 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016, failure to maintain the pace of the rapid upward trajectory in human wealth and prosperity that began in 1870. Um, we finally failed to maintain that upward trajectory then. Um, so that's my grand narrative. Um, now, um, Friedrich von Hayek the Austro-English Chicago and moral philosopher genius, looking over my right shoulder, observes the most observed most powerfully the market economy crowdsources. You know, it incentivizes and coordinates everyone to work toward solutions to the problems that it sets itself. Now, humanity had had market economies, or at least market sectors within our economies, for thousands of years before 1870. But we did not back then have the institutions or the technologies to allow the market economy to pose the problem of how to make the economy rich. Around 1870, we got those institutions and technologies. We got full globalization. We got the industrial research laboratory. We got the modern corporation. These were the keys. Those unlocked the gate. The problem of making humanity rich could now be posed to the market economy because it had a solution, and the market economy was very good at crowdsourcing the solution to material abundance in production, if not in distribution. And on the other side of this gate, the trail to utopia came into view. Much good it should have followed that. If we try to put some rough magnitudes on this, say, 
and the years from, say, 1000 BC up to 1500, the rate of growth of human technology, of the amount by which each year our ability to manipulate nature and organize ourselves increases. Now, up to 1500, it grew by 0.035% per year. That's 3.5% per century. That worldwide in the year 700, people were about 3.5% more capable at manipulating nature and organizing themselves than they'd been in the year 600. Then come 1500 to 1770, the pace leaps up to 0.15% per year. A century now sees 15%. From 1770 to 1870, you know, it's 0.45% per year. Over the course of a century, you can see really significant improvements in human technology. The problem was that even from 1770 to 1870, Technology was not winning its race with fecundity. You know, people were richer, yes. People were enough richer that there was a population explosion going on. And as of 1870, it was not at all clear that the improvements in technology were going to lead to improvements in the standard of living of anyone other than the upper class and a misnamed middle class that was still only a small fraction of the global population. It was only with the coming of the modern corporation, the Industrial Research Lab, and full globalization um, from 1870 to 2012 or so that the rate of growth of human technology to manipulate nature and organize humans soared to 2.1% per year, and technology far outraced fecundity. Moreover, when people got rich enough, and when people got rich enough that women could were taught to read and had lots of social power, and people no longer had to fear that their children would die, hence you have to have many children if you want to be reasonably sure one will survive to help you in your old age, should you be lucky enough to reach an old age. Um, that it turned out that once humanity got rich enough, the problem of the population explosion solved itself. And we are now headed for a steady state in world population around 2050 of somewhere between 9 and 10 billion people, after which population history will take a different course than the population explosion we have seen over the past century and a half. It's this 1870 to 2012 that has really opened possibilities. Now, why? Um... From 1500 to 1770, things were different because of globalization and imperialism. Globalization in the form of the ocean-going caravel and imperialism in the form of the musket and the cannon. And the property order that allowed people to be merchants first without having to be a merchant and a warrior. That is, before 1500, pretty much all over the world. You know, say, to focus on positive sum mercantile or productive activity was to leave you vulnerable with thugs with spears who would take your stuff. And even where there weren't local bandits or roving bandits, um, there was still the government. And so up until 1500, pretty much everywhere in the world, even if there was substantial order... If you were more than rich enough as a merchant, you then had to become a statesman. You then had to become someone of political influence, or you would find your wealth going away. After 1500, for the first time, we really get durable, limited governments in which people can be confident that the property they have acquired by the rules of the game will, in fact, stick to theirs. And so people interested in positive sum invention, entrepreneurship, trade, commerce, and production can specialize in that, can leave the military and can leave the governance to others. And that turns out to make a difference, although probably not as big a difference as globalization and imperialism. From 1770 to 1870, we have the starts of automatic machinery and the start of the application of science to manipulating nature. And we have coal and steam. 
But that makes a big difference. Although not enough of a difference to outrun population growth. It's in 1870 and 2012 that we have the explosion in riches. Um, the explosion in riches that makes humanity not desperately poor for the first time in its history that we know of. That over 1870 to 2012, our human technological capabilities grow by at least 20-fold and maybe much more. Our populations grow six-fold um, to our current 7.8 um, billion from 1.2 billion. Our prosperity grows at least ninefold, where the world as a whole is nine times as rich as it was back in 1870, although such calculations are very hard and very fraught. And all good things should have flowed from that. But do remember that riches are vastly more unequally distributed around the globe today than they were in 1870. But, um, not only much good flowed from all this, an awful lot of ill flowed from all of this as well. People can and do use technologies, both the harder ones for manipulating nature and the softer ones for organizing humans, to exploit, to dominate, and to tyrannize. And the long 20th century saw the worst and most bloodthirsty tyrannies that we know of. And also, much that was mixed, you know, um, Good and ill also flowed. That is, before, technologies changed only slowly. So your style of life, or at least the possibilities for your style of life, always looked a lot like what your parents looked like. You know, economy and society were stable. After 1870, that was false. Economic change, what Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction, was so great that all that was solid melted into air, um, or rather perhaps all established orders and patterns were steamed away. Only a small proportion of economic life could be and was carried out at the start of the 2010s the same way it had been in 1870. And even that portion of the same was very different. Even were you doing the same tasks in the same places that your predecessors had been doing back in 1870, others would pay much less of the worth of the labor time for what you do and made. And nearly everything economic changed. The economy was revolutionized every generation in those places on the earth that were lucky enough to be the growth poles. And those changes shaped and transformed nearly everything sociological, political, and cultural as well. Constant revolutionizing, constant destruction of old forms of life, constant creation of new ones. Yes, it was vastly a win for humanity. Many more winners and losers, and those winners gained immensely more than the losers lost. But the losers did lose from economic creative destruction. And the fact that you might become a loser um, caused great anxiety. So suppose we could go back in time to 1870 and tell people then how rich relative to the people of 1870 humanity would have become by the early 2010s. How would they have reacted? They would almost surely have thought that the world of 2010 must be a paradise, a utopia. You know, nine times as much wealth per capita. That Surely that would be enough power to manipulate nature and organize humans so that all but the most trivial of problems and obstacles hobbling humanity could be resolved. But not so. Right? It has been 150 years. We did not run to the trail's end and reach utopia. Um, we are still on the trail, maybe for we can no longer see clearly to the end of the trail or even to wherever the trail we are going on is going to lead. That confidence that progress will lead us to a good place, um, I think is more absent in our society today than it has been at any time since some, well, since the late 1800s when people first began to realize how great an economic El Dorado, how great an economic revolution, globalization, the industrial research lab, and the corporation were leading us to. So what went wrong? Um, 
I have ideas. I won't say I really know. I'll talk about those ideas in the next segment.